what it should look like, and it seemed to have the structure of a typical G protein coupled receptor. It's a large family clan of proteins with many families that are cell surface receptors. And so it had the seven tr uh, pass transmembrane domains. It had a long um, N-terminal extracellular domain, and it had a long C-terminal extracellular domain. It had an eighth helix that's found in many GPCRs. It had sites for G protein binding and activation and signaling, which all of, so all of the things that should make it a G protein coupled receptor. Now, it is a member of the family C glutamate family by its homology with trans, uh, the, 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 seven, the seven transmembrane domain. And you can, this is a very small family. The family A, which for adoption belongs to, is quite large, several hundred members, but this is a very small family. And there are a number, this, this includes the glutamate receptors, which you've heard about today already. It includes taste receptors. It includes the GABA receptors, a lot, of, a lot of very important receptors that are found in the brain and the retina. And then there are the seven uncharacterized orphans, so-called, with no known ligands and with no known function. And so GPR-158 is one of those, and also a very closely related gene called GPR-179. Well, as, we, as our paper was in review, another paper actually came out and told us about GPR-158 in the retina and GPR-179 as well. And it turns out that GPR-179 is um, responsible for the no B-wave mouse and, oh, five minutes already, okay. And <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it, it acts like a typical G-protein coupled receptor and it's found in the plasma membrane. And we were able to reproduce that data and showed that um, we, we got the same cell intracellular localization in the cells that were used in the two published papers that came out just before ours. However, in our hands, in trabecular meshwork cells, the gene did not go to the plasma membrane, it went to the nucleus. And so you can see best here in this enlarged photo, um, it, the red is the nuclear standing in the, in the um, Green is the, where the protein is localized, and it seems to be in very discrete areas in the nucleus. And this shows a western blot that indicates there's a cleavage somewhere near the end of the cytoplasmic tail, but both of the fragments appear in the nucleus. So we did an experiment to see whether the gene would actually get to the plasma membrane and maybe it goes there first and then goes to the nucleus after. And it seems that that is the case. This shows just a diagram of the typical clathrin dependent endocytosis. So a protein would traffic to the plasma membrane, a receptor, and then it would, um, it would be recycled into these clathrin vesicles and move inside the cell. And then from there, it would go to the nucleus if it had a nuclear localization signal, which was found in our, in our receptor. So if we treat the cells with inhibitors of clathrin-mediated endocytosis, the protein goes from being in the nucleus to being on the cell membrane, plasma membrane. So it does behave, even in the trabecular meshwork cells, like a normal uh, G-protein coupled receptor. And then what we did was make mutations in the nuclear localization signal, which, which are shown here, and we had three different mutations. And in all cases, we found that there was no, no longer any nuclear localization, uh, translocation. Instead, the protein was found in endocytic, endocytic vesicles within the cytoplasm and clustered sort of underneath the nucleus. Now, we found that when cells were transfected with overexpressed GPR-158, they proliferated at a much higher level, as shown on this chart. So that stimulates, the, pr the presence of the protein stimulates cell proliferation, and if you knock it down with siRNA, you greatly inhibit cell proliferation. But if the protein is mutated in the nuclear localization signal, it can't get into the nucleus, proliferation is blocked. Then we also asked about something that might be more relevant to glaucoma in whether or not this protein could affect paracellular permeability. And we used a cell culture model 
which we plated trabecular meshwork cells so they were very high density and very closely opposed to one another. And then we tried, we asked whether um, dextran could get through that cell layer and how, how easily it could get through. And if we added IL, whoops, if we added IL-1, which is a stimulator of paracellular permeability, we got much better um, permeability than in the untreated. But GPR-158 inhibited, significantly inhibited paracellular permeability. So this all fits the idea that it would be a, a, a gene that would, if overexpressed, <coughs> induced by glucocorticoids, would cause um, um, ocular hypertension. Now this is all combined with the fact that we induce tight junction proteins, O1, occludin, but selectively tight junctions, and cadherin is not induced. So let me just summarize what I said in my one minute. Um, GPR-158, it's all about location, location, location. We have non-canonical activities at the cell surface. We're, we're involved in electrical networking and depolarization, which causes neuronal signaling. But if it does go into the nucleus, then changes in gene expression can affect things like ocular hypertension. Now the question still remains, does this gene signal like a normal G-protein coupled receptor? Is there G-protein binding and is there, does that result in a single in, signal into the cell? The, the other two papers, one from the Martyev lab, the, sorry, the one other paper from the Mart, Mart, Martemyanov lab, uh, did, did not find any indication of G-protein signaling this. Um, presence on the plasma membrane influenced other G-protein coupled receptors, but not, not, it didn't signal itself. And we don't find that as well either. So there's still that question remaining. And I want to point out that the, normally the place where ligands would bind is very different than the other glutamate receptors in the family. However, when we did some bioinformatics analysis, we discovered that there was a Wnt inhibitory factor binding site. And we're now doing some experiments to learn whether that might be the ligand. It would explain a lot of the behaviors that we've been able to identify. And notice also in the tail, we have binding of PIDX2, and we have binding of CMYK, and those are also um, wind signaling pathway um, regulated genes. So um, I explained that already. So, so we have two next steps, and that we'd like to really confirm that this is involved in aqueous outflow by using a more um, the model, the, the, the model that everyone would accept as as uh, showing this, and that would be the anterior segment um, anterior segment outflow model, which we we are just starting to do. We'll we'll transduce the. Um, tissue with lentiviruses. And we, as an alternate, sort of a parallel hypothesis, we hypothesize the gene is involved in retinal signaling. And there is an ARVO abstract that suggests that it's present mostly in the photoreceptors. So that's where we'll, we'll start um, by doing ERG analysis and looking at the retinas to see if there's any degeneration. I want to acknowledge my colleagues for the paper that we, do, oops, that we just published on this subject. Um, which just came out about a week ago in PLOS One, and all of my many other colleagues at USC for their collaboration in the next steps. And I just happened to pull that off of my computer, Betty. I thought it was a really neat picture. You remember when we went to, um, we went to Washington to do a little lobbying? Where's Betty? She's not here, oh no. <laughs> but Carlos is here. Carlos, you were the one who took the picture. <laughs> okay. That was about five or six years ago, I think. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, actually, I'm going to talk about the human Usher syndrome, which is the most common form of combined terry jerry deaf blindness. This, the clinical symptoms of this rare disease are hearing impairment, vestibular dysfunction, and vision loss. Clinically, it can be um, distinguished three types based on the severity, the age of onset, as well as the progression of the symptoms. Genetically, it's much more heterogeneous, and so far, 10 different ash causing genes have been identified, and three additional loci are discussed. And if we go to the protein level, we can see that the proteins which are encoded by these ASHA proteins belong to different protein families, 
One each is a GPCR, a molecular motor, cell adhesion proteins, and the functional analysis revealed that all these proteins are integrated into a, a large network. And you can imagine that if one of these compounds is missing, you get a degeneration of the inner ear leading to the deafness or the photoreceptor cells leading to the vision loss. Due to the newborn deaf screening, the inner ear defects are diagnosed quite early. So um, the children get a diagnosis right after birth. And the hearing deficits can be compensated with hearing aids or with cochlear implants. In contrast to this, the vision loss starts during puberty, most of the time with night blindness, and at that stage, the patients are diagnosed. And as for the most other retinal degenerations, there's currently no treatment for the vision loss in Asher. As I mentioned, Asher is an autosomal recessive disorder. The re-expression of the protein might stop the retinal degeneration. And it has <coughs> been shown that gene addition is a quite promising tool for this. However, for Asher, we have the problem that some of these genes are that large that it cannot be packed into viruses. And in addition, there are genes which are expressed in several isoforms, and we do not know which isoform is essential for restoring the vision. We performed some transcription analysis, and there we found that, for example, harmonin, which is encoded by the ash von z gene, has at least nine different isoforms in the retina. And these isoforms can be grouped into three classes, and they differ in the composition of their protein domains. All have these PDZ domains, which mediate protein-protein interactions. They have coiled coil domains, which um, leads to the dimerization of these proteins. And especially the B isoforms have a PST domain, which induce the bundling of actin filaments. And so far, we really do not know which of these isoforms is essential for photoreceptor cell function. We therefore thought we need an alternative for gene addition experiments. Patient screening reveals that uh, approximately 20% of ASH causing mutations are so called nonsense mutations. Here, just a short update what are nonsense mutations. So, nonsense mutations are point mutations which alter a triplet coding normally for an amino acid, in this case the arginine, to a so called stop codon. And this leads to the stop in the protein translation. If we have a closer look on the molecular mechanism, this means that at the side of the stop codon, the ribosomes fall off the mRNA and the protein translation is stopped. And why we got interested in this nonsense mutation is the fact that in the last years, some molecules have been identified which can induce the overread of these nonsense mutations. These small molecules, I call them TRITs for translational read-through inducing drugs, belong to different groups. And the most famous one is PTC-124. Uh, this drug is already in phase three clinical trials for Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy and for cystic fibrosis. And the other um, drugs we are dealing with are the so-called designer ami aminoglycosides MB30 or MB54. Designer aminoglycosides, due to the fact that uh, they are modified molecules based on the classical aminoglycoside paramomycin or gentamicin. These lead compounds can induce read through, but it has been shown that they are quite toxic. They induce autotoxicity as well as nephrotoxicity. And this is why our collaborator in Israel modified these lead compounds to maintain the read through efficiency but have a much better biocompatibility. So, in first <coughs> cell culture experiments, <coughs> we just transfected. Um, this R31X mutation I showed you in the beginning into cells, added the TRITs to the uh, me medium, and looked for the re-expression of harmonin. Here on the left side, you see the immune fluorescence staining, and each cell which appears to be green is expressing the harmonin. And in the Western blood analysis, is that we can see that this re-expressed protein have the right size at approximately 72 kilodalton. 
and the quantification revealed that uh, this aminoglycoside of the second generation have the highest um, read-through activity compared to the clinical approved PTC-122 or the aminoglycoside of the first generation. Unfortunately, the amino acid which is integrated into this growing protein is not the one which is normally located. You have to prove that this protein is really functional. And for this, we make use of the known interaction of harmonin. So we know that harmonin is interaction with the cytoplasmic domain of the transmembrane protein H2A. And what we can see is that we only transfect the mutated harmonin without any traits, we cannot detect an interaction. But if we add one of the traits, we can restore the scaffold function of harmonin. In addition, we know that these B isoforms can induce this actin filament bundling, as it has been shown here. And we can also show that if we transfect the cells with the harmony B P31X uh, construct and incubate the cells with the trits, we can restore this actin filament bundling. So we can show that at least this mutation can be read through with the tracks and we can restore the function. But so far it has been analyzed, it hasn't been analyzed if these drugs have a good retinal biocompatibility. And this is what we did next. So we got um, human eyeballs, we isolated the retina and cultured them for three days in the presence of the trits and analyzed uh, the biocompatibility by um, measuring, uh, by determining the histology and also the apoptosis rate, which is going on in this explant. This is uh, what I want to show. All these green cells are cells which are currently undergoing apoptosis. And you can see that here with the clinical gentamicin drug, you can see a lot of green cells, which is not the case for the second generation aminoglycoside of a PTC-122. And this is the quantification of this data. So we see a significant decrease in the apoptosis rate with PTC-122 as well as with MB-52. So we s now s uh, thought, okay, it looks like these drugs have a really good retinal biocompatibility. Let's go ahead and look what's the situation in vivo. Unfortunately, we do not have an ash animal mouse model carrying a nonsense mutation, so we had to introduce this mutation into newborn pups. So we Supratinal inject our harmonin construct with the mutation in the eye of newborn mice, electroporated them, waited six weeks to let the mice grow, and then subretinal inject the trits, and three days later we analyzed the recovered harmonin expression in this retina. So here is the situation what we get when we perform a cytohistology. On the left hand side, the mock treated with DMSO. There's only a slight autofluorescence. And if we um, inject the PTC 122, we get a relatively strong increase of the green fluorescence, indicating that we had an increase of harmony in expression. And this can also be seen here in the quantification of this immunofluorescence um, intensity. We also performed Western blood analysis, and there we could see that in the untreated eyes, we do not get um, harmony in RFP expression, whereas in the eyes treated with MB54 or PTC124, we get at least a double fold increase in the harmony in expression in these eyes. So let me summary. The traits we analyzed induced the read through of Ashfonsi Nonsense nonsense mutation in cell culture and in vivo and the recovered H1C protein is functional. And we now have evidence that uh, another nonsense mutation in harmony can be read through with these drugs, and we extend these efforts in uh, H1, H2A causing nonsense mutation and in clarin causing nonsense mutation. We could prove that the second generation aminoglycoside MB54 and PTC124 have an excellent retinal biocompatibility. And therefore, we saw that the traits have a high potential as therapeutics for the treatment of retinal degeneration caused by nonsense mutation, not only for us, but also for the other retinal degenerations. This work was done in 
our lab in Mainz, mainly by Tobias uh, Goldman. We had a lot of collaborators, Timo Basov, which are uh, designing this great amino glycosides, and for sure, we had a lot of financial supporters. And I thank you for your attention. I thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be in your um, in your audience and um, as, a, as a speaker as well. Um, I'm going to tell you today about some work we've been doing on antisense oligonucleotide therapy for Usher syndrome. Um, I'm going to start with acknowledgments just so I don't forget them in the end. And it's very important to point out that this work in, was done in my lab, um, mostly by Fran and Anthony, and also really a, a fantastic collaboration I've had with Dr. Lenz at um, Louisiana State University and other people, other labs there that helped, as well as Dominic Lally and Isis Pharmaceuticals and Frank Rigo provide us with the antisense oligonucleotides and the work is instrumental between these three groups. And also support for the work coming from um, a variety of places. Really, I have to give a call out to a lot of these grassroots um, organizations for giving us start out money that would really got this project going. So Kirsten gave a great overview to Usher syndrome, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on that, which is great. In fact, we're working on the same um, gene, in particular the Usher1C for hormonin, so I'm gonna jump right to that. We are actually interested in, a, well, the story I'll tell you today is about a particular mutation, sometimes referred to as the Acadian Usher syndrome mutation. It's a, a 216G um, to A point mutation in the Usher1C gene. And the reason it's called the Acadian um, mutation is because it's found in the Acadian population of Louisiana and Quebec. Um, it accounts for all of the cases of Usher syndrome in those populations. So uh, again, as Kirsten, just as a reminder, Usher1C is a very large gene, has a lot of different splicing variants as well as protein isoforms. The mutation that we are looking at is this 216G to A mutation and it occurs in exon three of the gene and it results in a misplicing, which produces a frame shift and a stop codon in exon four. Okay, just to focus in more closely, give you a little more details about that particular mutation. So here's exon two, three, and four in the blocks. The mutation is approximately in, in, in this position here, and it creates a de novo, a new five prime splice site. So that's a, at the site where splicing occurs to splice out the intron. When it uses that splice site, um, what happens as again is you get a frame shift because um, it's deleting out the end of the exon. It's a frame shift and it leads to a truncated 135 amino acid protein that's not going to be functional and Usher syndrome. So our approach um, and our real interest in this mutation in particular was the, the type of mutation that it was, which being this 5 prime splice site. And so our idea was to use these antisense oligonucleotides, which are very short nucleic acids. In this case, we're using 18 mers that are designed, these second generation type of chemistry by Isis Pharmaceuticals. And the whole premise here is that we take these small oligonucleotides, they're going to base pair very specifically across the, that de novo 5 prime splice site where the mutation is, and it's gonna block the splicing machinery from recognizing that site. And then the idea is that having that there, it's gonna block that site and it's gonna redirect splicing to the correct site. So that was the whole rationale and premise for using this type of an antisense oligonucleotide therapy to try to correct gene expression with this particular form of Usher syndrome. So the story I'm gonna tell you about, we actually just recently what was published by our group, I'm gonna just tell you some abbreviated points about, about this story and if, if you're more interested um, you can go to that particular publication. So what I'm not going to tell you about is a long um, process of developing the ASO, which in fact was, they're very easy to, um, to synthesize. Designing them and finding the exact precise optimal location took some work in vitro, which I'm not going to discuss, but I'm going to jump right to the in vivo work, working with um, them after we designed the antisense oligo to put them into the mice. And this was made possible by Jen's early work as a graduate student actually in Bronya Keats lab where she made the knock-in mouse. So the mouse had the exact mutation as a human knocked into the gene. 
And this is a particularly um, poignant story in that um, that the Acadians, which the mutation is based on, are in Louisiana, and Jen's lab is in Louisiana, and these mice survived a lot, um, as their paper um, indicates here. So it's really a fantastic sort of local story, as well as um, what turns out to be a, a great story for Usher syndrome. So the mice are great. They have they recapitulate the human disease. They have severe vestibular dysfunction. They're hearing impaired, and they have the, um, visual deficits, as I'll show you. So we started out. Our treatment regimen, once we had an ASO in hand that was working really well in, vit in vitro, in cells, was um, our first experiment was really rather naive. We just decided we probably should put them into, uh, as early as possible, into the mice. So we did an IP injection of ASO into the pups at P5 different times. And we did a whole number of assays to see how well they were working. And in the beginning, we really were just expecting to see whether we could get the splicing switch in vivo. To our surprise, however, we saw some pretty striking results, even behaviorally. So I'm just going to show you a movie. The first one is showing our het mice, normal mouse, and then our mutant mouse. It has not been treated. And what you'll see is um, a really obvious vestibular defect. They run in circles quite, um, they're quite almost hyperactive in this vestibular dysfunction. So they have a very overt phenotype. It's quite easy to detect by two weeks of age. So now I'm going to show you um, really the first result we got when we put the mouse in vivo, which is rarely something that happens, something that's such a great result when you first uh, start in vivo. This is, again, a hep mouse treated with our ASO that's targeted to the mutation. And this is a mutant mouse, the same genotype as this one, but we've now put in one time at P5 our ASO, and these mice are P21 um, at this point. So as you can see, that treated mouse is completely normal, behaving normally. We, At this point, when we saw this, we were convinced that we had really um, treated the um, vestibular dysfunction in these mice. And it was uh, one of those really clear type of uh, results you love to see. Well, um, we um, did a lot of quantitation of this. This, again, is just quantitating the rotations at different time points. If you inject, even after at P13, after birth, you can rescue this vestibular defect. If you treat later at P16, no, you don't. So there's a pretty clear window of opportunity here for the vestibular function anyway. We can rescue this, actually, this is an older slide at six months showing that we rescue that vestibular dysfunction up to six months after one single treatment at P5. Um, and now we have mice up to nine months in a year where we've done these tests and they never circle and we do swim tests out to a year and they can swim. So we're pretty confident that we've really sort of cure that vestibular function in the mice. So we were really interested, of course, in the, in the hearing as well, because this is a phenotype that is easily um, assayed. And so this, at two months and six months of age, these are um, auditory brainstorm response done by Jen at three different frequencies. You can see that the, um, the threshold of hearing for the heterozygotes is here in the treated mice are similar at the low frequencies. We didn't rescue hearing at the high frequencies, but at the low frequencies at two months and three months. Here at six months, you can see we're starting to see some loss of the of, of hearing, but it's still better than the, um, than the untreated mice. So we've done a, um, some, the rescue of hearing was fairly clear. Um, what, it's remarkable when we look at splicing, so of course I haven't told you really what the ASL was doing yet, but when we look at correct splicing, we see a similar, this um, correction of splicing in the cochlea here out to um, six months, it sort of peaks at three months, and then um, out to six months, we see um, still correction of, of splicing relative to the untreated. But what you also can notice is we don't get a large correction of splicing. And so this was a surprise to us that we could see such a very strong um, correction with relatively low um, amount of uh, increase in, in splice, correct splicing. And so I'm kind of glad we saw the behavior before we saw the molecular effect because we might not have ever wanted to go forward with this low of uh, correction. And so it's sort of a lesson to be learned about when you're looking for effects of drugs, for example, that not, not necessarily getting the, you don't necessarily always need a huge effect. Um, however, at the protein level, we were surprised to see that we did get um, um, complete rescue of protein levels in the a P30 anyway. And so this suggests that the protein is very stable, so we don't need a lot of RNA expression to get eventually the, the amount of protein that is, you see in the cell. 
Okay, so um, a long ways to get now. Obviously, um, I haven't talked about the vision yet, and this is the Hope for Vision conference. So this is our next um, thing that we're, we're really focusing on here. We have some early data with looking in the retina. The good news is that the ASO also reaches the retina when we do an, inter, an IP injection at P5. So um, if we do a P5 and look at P12, P30, and P120, doesn't seem to be quite as lasting from an IP injection into the eye, into the in the retinas. You can see that the that um, the effect is going away for the splicing at least, but we still see some after um, after the three months. We've also started to try to optimize our dosing by doing um, IVI injections and um, dosing, so we've been able to increase the amount of correct splicing. So we're confident, and we're going to start doing some subretinal and some different types of approaches for delivery. But of course, if it's anything like what happened in the in the ear, we we were able to get a pretty profound effect with the with even um, less amount of correct splicing than what we see here. So uh, we have done some very early, and this was with uh, IP samples. So sort of our less optimized treatment strategy, and we did some initial ERGs, Jen did, I should say, and we did see here's the um, wild type animal and the mutant animal and the treated animal. So there is a trend towards perhaps some rescue of visual function, but the differences in the, are, are fairly subtle even between the wild type and the mutant and the mutant treated. So you know we have to have a lot more animals and we're also working on different models of the particular um, mutation to see if we can um, get a more robust um, difference here so we can see a higher, better window of, of correction. Um, in the future, we're really interested in trying to target other mutations because obviously now we have a tool that we know can work in the ear and in the eye. And so because it's so specific, we can look at different classes of mutations and types of mutations and um, target them. So one we're really interested in because it's also in the H1C and actually in exon 3 is this um, 238, 239 insert C, which is also um, common in, the, in um, European populations. The idea here is that in, it, that um, creates a stop codon, and so the, our approach here has been to skip, um, try to skip or do skipping of exon three. When that happens, you actually um, keep the whole mRNA in frame, so you would just have a, a small deletion, 48 amino acid deletion.